obviously this evening as we did this morning, a little bit different. Um, just share, first of all, that, just to set the context a little bit, um, when I was uh, 17, uh, I, the reason I moved from Belfast to England was to, to, to be in the Royal Air Force. And uh, that was an adventure that I uh, took the plunge with. And um, I can remember, if, if any of you have ever been in the forces, the first few weeks are very traumatic. It's quite a culture shock, I suppose is the term we would use now. And uh, it was so for me in the first couple of weekends, I found it really difficult moving from Belfast to Lincolnshire. But the interesting thing was, I was 17, and most of us were around about 17 or 18, and uh, all the raw recruits. But there was a man who was 25 and had been in the Air Force before, and for some reason had come out. And, he had been a military policeman in his first kind of instalment and then he came back in again and even he was a bit shocked at the rigour of the discipline. He thought it might have eased a bit, <laughs> but it hadn't. It was quite this first six weeks is terrible after that, it's a breeze. But anyway, that's another story. And, um, but the thing was, this, this gentleman's called Graham, he was my rock really because I could ask him anything and he'd been in before, he'd done it all before, he knew the ropes. Uh, and when you were under pressure from very aggressively sounding sergeants and so on, he used to say, you know, he used to counsel you and he used to give you advice. And it was very, very helpful. Um, and he was, uh, you know, became a, he remained, remained a friend of the whole time I was in my basic training. Then we went our separate ways. But the reason I mention is that what I, what I want to do in, in this brief time, it is brief, and actually I, I hadn't appreciated when, when I knew it was coming this evening as well, that I hadn't appreciated about the, the different type of approach this evening in the sense of it would be communion as well because this fits really well because uh, what I want to do is to in a very short time, so I'll say something briefly about each thing is to point you to six councils of the Lord Jesus Christ to his church now they were said in, in different contexts and the reason I'm saying is that we live in strange times and they could become more strange. Uh, and you know, you, uh, and when I say, when I make a statement like that, you know, your mind will go off to different aspects of the strangeness of the days we live in. Um, so many, many. I mean, even what it means to be a human being is being analysed and, and, and reshaped by many. And the Lord Jesus gave. Uh, I mean, the Gospels are full of His counsel and His instruction. But what I've done is I've, I've gathered together. Uh, six councils that are strikingly important for our times. And so the first is this, and we'll look at different passages. You, you can make a note or you can flip through, but I'm going to move fairly quickly because obviously time is short. But um, The first is here in John 16, but that kind of sets the scene. And of course, he's in the upper room with the disciples, and there's all that wonderful counsel at that particular time. So because we're going to have communion as well, it really does fit nicely. All this I have told you, so that you will not fall away, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're, they're offering a service to God. So the first counsel is this. We were never told it would be easy. We need to have realism about opposition. Now that takes different forms in different contexts, different countries. Uh, but for us, we have our peculiar... UK setting. And uh, this is one of the of many similar statements and councils. Not every Christian and every time faces such opposition that is mentioned here in, that, in verse 1 of chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Um, Peter, who was there, told believers in his letter not to consider fiery trials a strange and unexpected thing. James, who was there, wrote that we should rejoice in trials. And we may yet face significant opposition. We shouldn't be surprised and we shouldn't be afraid. But a lot of the things that we stand for are right at the center of controversy. And it's worth thinking about that. And yet the Lord Jesus counsel is, uh, I'm putting it to you like this, we were never told it was going to be easy. His counsel was, they will put you out of the synagogue, etc., etc. Now that was for those disciples particularly. But there's much instruction about this. Not that we want to be overly obsessed with it in that sense, 
But we happen to be afraid and we happen to be surprised. And that was a counsel that Jesus gave. Um, so it will, it's, it's rather like a meditation this evening, just to, to prepare us for our, our, our time together in food and, the, and then in fellowship around the Lord's table. So that's the first one. The second one is this, we must avoid materialism. Well, isn't to say we, we can't have material things. Materialism, realism about riches. Remember, Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And of course, you remember the parable of the sower reminds us of the, the way the pleasures of the world can choke the word. And then that other beautiful passage, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And then strikingly, Mark 8, 36, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world? yet forfeit their soul. I think one of the most powerful statements uh, the Lord Jesus ever uttered. I, I, I find it so striking. God gives good gifts and they are to be richly enjoyed, but always with a view to their totally limited power. So we hold them lightly. Jesus spoke about these things not only to the rich, but also to the poor. I always find that very striking. He spoke to everyone on these issues. And at either end of the spectrum, people can be guilty of becoming overly absorbed or obsessed with those things. And money does make the world go round, but it makes the world go round in circles because it can never deliver what it seems to promise. And in extremity, God is our hope and our hand. And of course the world is immersed in this and we must be wise to that because that's our default mode. Um, and by all means be thankful for God's good gifts. But don't take your eyes off the giver. So the day in which we live, and, and, and you know, just to save time, we can't elaborate too much on, on all of these things. But you get the train of thought. You were never told it would be easy. We must have realism about opposition to the gospel. In opposition to the truth of God. We must avoid materialism. Thirdly, we must endeavour to grow in godly character and holiness of mind. Now we need that increasingly. There are so many challenges to this. Matthew 13, you'll remember this, I'm sure some of you, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop uh, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Again, John 15. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Jesus looks for fruitfulness. Now, there are many kinds of fruit. There are the fruit what we might call of character. There are the fruits which may come, or the fruit which may come as a result of a work of service, a productive, if you like, along those lines. And the Christian life is not meant to be static. And uh, now that I'm not that far off 70 years of age, I can say that. We've got to keep growing. I always take the perspective, we are not running out of time, we are running into eternity. So we can have that big perspective. And that's what the Lord Jesus emphasized. That we will be, we are to be fruitful. And, and there's a lot to choke spiritual life and living. Now again, Peter, who was there when those words were uttered in John 15, as I've already mentioned, and 16, urged Christians to grow in grace and in knowledge. So there's three of our six councils. We must uh, have realism about opposition. We were never told it was going to be easy. We must avoid materialism. We must have a realism about wealth and riches and possession and status and all the things that the world clings on to so strongly. 
We must endeavor to grow in godly character and holiness of life. It is constantly taught in the scripture. Now these things that, that come from the Lord Jesus, they flew out and they influence all the thinking of the, the, the apostles and the writers of the New Testament. So a fourth counsel of the Lord Jesus is, um, I'll put it to you like this and, and, and cite some verses. We must work, we have to do our work, and what you do as a church, and what you do together, and what you do individually, a little bit like we were saying this morning. But we must depend on the Holy Spirit for effective communication of gospel truth. Now, we, we examined Paul at pretty close up this morning as he stood before Agrippa and all the way he engaged with him, how he handled it, what he said, uh, how he dealt with the circumstances. Mark 13, 11. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. What a comforting word. John 15, 26. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Now yes, th this is, this particularly Mark 13, it's an emergency situation. Um, it's not an excuse for laziness or slackness. But it's comforting to know that sometimes if we were put on the spot, the Lord may just give us exactly the right word to say. And it may, it may be very short and simple, it may be a little bit more complex, but when the Lord gives you it, it can be very effective. But in a world of spiritual death, and we need to remember this, the Spirit alone can breathe life. Now again, we reflected a bit on this this morning. Paul was reasoning, he was appealing to the facts, he was appealing to the fact that it was open, it wasn't done in a corner, etc, etc, etc. But he was not depending on that, he was depending on the Spirit. Now it's funny, I, I, I noted down a while ago that, that there's a church I know of, but every Thursday morning, I think it's 8 o'clock, they have a, a prayer meeting specifically for conversions. And then I was speaking to another chap earlier last week, and he happened to say to me, they have a seven o'clock, no virtue in the time. <laughs> they, they have a seven o'clock prayer meeting for exactly the same thing. And it's interesting how in both churches there have been recent conversions. Very encouraging. And uh, we just need to make sure that we hold on to this fact, that we need the work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. I mean, I shared with you this morning about my encounter with John's Gospel. And... Um, you know, thinking back, I knew very little about things, and yet it had such a powerful effect on me in reading it, with very little knowledge of it, only back to my Sunday school days. But the Holy Spirit clearly applied it to me, and it became life-changing. I'm not a significant person in the world, but I know this, I'm going in a very different direction to where I would have been if the Lord Jesus hadn't confronted me. It's a power, and if I can put it to you like this, it's a power that can overturn apathy and arrogance and antagonism and atheism. The Holy Spirit can sweep them aside. It's good to remember that. Because sometimes we think it's down to us. Yes, we have to work. I'm not advocating any kind of recipe for uh, slackness. We've got to do our utmost. But this is where our dependence comes. And we need, I would put it like this, we need a constant, conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit. And so the Lord Jesus counseled his disciples. This is what he said to them. That uh, we must depend upon the Spirit, his Spirit, that he would give us. So counsel number five. We must rejoice <coughs> that our names are written in heaven. Rejoice that our names are written in heaven. Luke 10 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written. This is a wonderful counsel. 
in, 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 a, in a complex world with all the challenges. And here's a great corrective to being carried away, even with God-given gifts. There is help to keep us glad, but to keep us balanced. As they say, power corrupts, but actually Jesus corrects. And it is the greatest of gifts and blessings to have your name written in heaven. I can't hardly think of anything better than that. And this joy, this, this, uh, this rejoicing here, it doesn't depend on our ability, our success, our achievements, our gifts, our status, or our insignificance. It doesn't depend on any of those things. It is the joy of grace given freely to sinful men and women. Your names in heaven. What a great thing. And the interesting thing is this. This joy actually never diminishes. But blossoms in eternity. And that's, that, that, that's just a wonderful reality. And this is a counsel for the times in which we live. Now... The, the final council, we've looked at six, I'll recap them in a moment. But the second, uh, sorry, the, the sixth and final is this. We must keep our focus on the consummation of all things. I'm trying to get a, a bit of a point of discipline about this. I have a friend who's a Portuguese pastor, and he was doing uh, a master's degree. And the subject of his thesis was, why preaching on the second coming had dropped off. Um, now, I've not read the thesis, I don't know how he, he progressed with it, but I was interested in the very concept. And this was in Portugal. Um, but I think it's true to say that when I was converted in, in, in the early 70s, um, there was a lot more prominence given. Now, I know I can list I can think of at least half a dozen reasons why that might be, that it, it, it could have dropped to some, to, to some extent. We need to keep our focus on that. I mustn't get too sidetracked on this. But Matthew 24, and of course you've got Matthew 24, you've got uh, Mark 13, you've got Luke 21, all these wonderful chapters which have a real focus on the second coming. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This will bring the ultimate climate change. And it's a climate of thinking. A climate and a climax. A consummation of all things. It's something that is, it should, it should be part of our regular anticipation without getting, um, you know, trying to predict things in any shape or form. And, you know, the, the way to be, and I've been thinking about this in another context, the way to be ready for the second coming is to be diligent and active in the Christian life. And if you, if you try to sort of scan the whole New Testament perspective on this, I think that's what you come back to. Diligence, alertness, uh, endeavouring in the Christian life, uh, in service, in character, in fellowship, all the different things that, that, that make that up. So that's our sixth council. How are we doing for time? I'm conscious it's a, we have a brief time this evening. I've got to be careful. But just tell you a lovely story. It's a true story. Uh, some of you will remember Peter Jackson, uh, who was a wonderful Christian preacher, but also a, a concert pianist. And a uh, lovely man. We had him at, at least two occasions at Brickhouse. And he used to sit at the piano and tell his story and play the piano and, uh, and, and preach the gospel. Lovely character. And he told the story. He was on a train with uh, the person that was accompanying him. Um, and obviously he couldn't see the lady, but he was aware that there was a lady opposite reading the newspaper. And she made a cry that loads of people made. She's reading the paper and she said, I don't know where I saw it. So Peter Jackson said, would you like me to tell <laughs> and he was, And he was such a gracious man. It would, say, it would have gone straight home to her like that. And, and they had a good conversation. 
And uh, it reminds me of my time, I, and I'm very rarely, I'm not the sort of person that would kind of just accost somebody on a train, but there was a young man, um, uh, a young man that uh, was sat reading Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, and I just, I felt compelled, and I just said to him, has it answered all your questions? <laughs> he said, no. So we, it, we then got into a conversation, we got off the train and leads together, we walked along the, the platform, it turned out, he had stopped going to the church that he, he grew up in. His father was a deacon of the church, and the pastor of that church was a man I knew very well, and a couple of other people in this room, but that will be a surprise. And, and he was a cameraman. Have you seen that TV program, um, One Born Every Minute? Mm -hmm. He was a cameraman for that, so he was on his way to St. James's maternity unit to film some childbirths. <laughs> an interesting uh, life uh, occupation. <laughs> and, uh, and so but we had a lovely conversation. But you see, where is life heading? And, and to come back to us as Christians, we must keep our focus on the consummation of all things. So let's just bring these things all together now. And I, I do think that when our eyes are properly fixed on Jesus, this is how we should think. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is comprehensive. It, it doesn't embrace everything. But I think these are big things. And I've said that they are counsels for specifically for our time and the challenges that we have. We were never told it would be easy. We must avoid materialism. We must endeavor to grow in godly character and holiness of life. That's to be worked at with the scripture in fellowship as such as we are now and so on. We must depend on the Holy Spirit. Yes, work. Yes, be diligent. But depend on the Holy Spirit for effective communication of gospel truth. Holy Spirit, wisdom and power. We must rejoice that our names are written in heaven. And we must keep our focus on the consummation of all things. Now, these are the things I believe that shape the apostles and, and in, in their production of the New Testament. They shape the early church. They shape the church at its best in all ages as you go through the centuries. And, uh, and uh, I can never forget this now because for the first time in my life, my house has a name which we've given it. And it is Tyndale after William. And so I remember one of the Lord's faithful ones through the years who lived according to this rule and these counsels. Now, with these six counsels of the Lord, I think we can be equipped for our time and every time and until time is no more. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have spoken so clearly to so many situations in life. You are the Lord of life, the Lord of history, the Lord of destiny, our Lord, our Saviour. Lord, bless us as we continue in fellowship now. May we receive your word and encourage one another. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks.